HLTP4 is all about focusing on form, the grammatical forms and structures, but by using a dialogic context through a special model that is called PACE. And this means that we're going to focus on form for a communicative purpose and in a communicative, a communicative context. That's very different from just looking at verb charts, for example, in a textbook. Um, the lesson actually has a sequence in which it starts with a whole text. I'll talk about that text in a second. And then moves to noticing a particular structure that is repeated throughout that text. And then there is dialogue or talk and interaction and conversation about that form that was repeated in the text and how it's used. And the teacher and the classmates do that conversation together. The teacher doesn't just tell the students about this new form and what it means and how it's used. The students are going to acquire the knowledge through this dialogue. And it finally ends with the student's self-selected use of the structure independently in oral interactions when they're speaking, as well as in creative projects, documents, and presentations. So the PACE form stands for presentation, attention, co-construction, and extension. Presentation means that um, teachers are going to use a culturally authentic story with lots of modeling of the, the desired form or structure so that students have a context within which to notice this new form. The attention phase directs the learners very specifically to begin to notice the form. So in the presentation phase, it's still all about the story. The form is there and it's repeated, but we're not drawing attention to it explicitly just yet, even though the learners might have noticed it. The attention phase is when we draw their attention to the form and it, it goes pretty quickly. The co-construction phase or the C is when the teacher um, actually starts to engage students in dialogue about this form, starting with some well-chosen questions that will lead learners to talk about what they're observing and noticing about the form that they just saw in the attention phase. And the extension phase is that last one when the students have actually grasped the understanding of that form and its use and are starting to use it um, in their own language experiences. And so this model supports learners to think about the targeted form so that the learners are the ones who make hypotheses and draw conclusions about its structure and how it should be used rather than the teacher just telling them. When learners make hypotheses based on observation, based on discussion, based on reflection, their learning is going to be deeper. So with that context in mind, we're going to talk to our experts right now about the this particular high leverage teaching practice in the context of the project-based learning learning that they shared earlier and we're going to start with laura um laura can you share some examples of how the pace model with cultural texts using those authentic texts as the starting point for introducing form and structure how that supports the elements of project-based language learning so i gotta confess that when I have used it most, I have not used it with the cultural text so much as learner text. Um, where I have used it most recently was with um, some novels from Fluency Matters. We were when we were doing the animal unit, the the savior animal friends, uh, Migos Animales, and um, we were drawing out the the different past tenses, the imperfect and the preterite, and we did one at a time. And I selected examples from the books that the students were working on. They had small literacy circles, which you could do with any article, really. And, and if you're doing it with something like a narrative, you, it's really pretty easy to pick a tense and pick out the examples to do that. So it wouldn't necessarily, it, at a novice level or a, an intermediate level, it could be something that was a narrative from an authentic target cultural member's point of view. I just, most recently, I used it with, the, with those novels. And um, so I, I picked out the sentences myself. I went through the, the text and I presented them on a slide, on Google Slides. And I had students jot down what they noticed and they just quietly did that. And so I drew their attention to it. And then I basically had the class brainstorm. And then we 
we picked out some elements that they noticed about things like, oh, they entered an ia or aba, and then I pulled out some questions about the verbs. I was trying to find the actual questions that I, I gave them on the slide too, but I, I'm not sure where those are since I moved districts. But um, they they were able to really quickly see some patterns in things like verb endings. And another way that would be really easy to do is if you had another other text that I've used that I haven't necessarily done paste with, but could, uh, or like how to things. There are lots of really good examples of imperative structures where students could see how the verbs are used to make commands. And if they're going to be trying to tell, tell someone how to do something, for example, I've done a, a children's cooking unit. Like if they were looking at recipes, for example, they could pull out the ways they could say, tell kids to, to cook something, to place something, to uh, to take out something. And so they, they could observe the structures and you can really just set it up so they see the patterns really easily. Um, yeah, so recipes would be a really obvious way to do that, really simple way. And I do find it tends to revolve around verbs when I have done it before. Um, we, I have done it with children's books. Not necessarily, well, we were working towards a children's day project and we picked out some of the structures, some of the, and again, it was with imperfect, um, so that they could see the pattern and then start to extrapolate what they knew about similar verbs before, if, if that answers the question. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I have one quick follow-up for you. Um, on the Google Slides, when you pulled out the examples from the stories that they had read, um, because I've done something similar, they'll read something and we, we treat it just as a story initially, and then I pull out quotes that highlight things I want them to notice. Um, do you use any any features of Google Slides to help make the patterns that you're trying to help them notice be more evident to them? So uh, it's kind of kind of silly, really, but um, I would show them sentence by sentence, and so like they they see one sentence and they'd have to mull over it very pensively, and then they I show them the next one. And then I asked when I was asking them what patterns they saw that they they usually their eyes were drawn right to it because they they saw the same ending over and over. But um, I also added little animations where you could add little boxes around the word so they could see it and highlight the specific endings. And um, I think I color coded the erir versus the ar so that you could see the two different types of imperfect endings. If I remember correctly. Thank you. I think that's really helpful for our users to hear that, that, first of all, the animation that can be used to insert shapes or highlighting that will draw attention using color coding, um, which I know my students have found incredibly helpful, and also the use of animations to kind of bring in things one at a time so that the learner knows what to focus on. Um, so that's all really helpful. And um, also those really specific examples about uh, children's books as sources, depending on what you're looking for, the recipes, and so on. Megan, did you quickly have something you wanted to add about um, that first question in terms of how the PACE model with cultural texts supports the elements of high quality project-based language learning? Sure, so this, uh, this project was uh, geared towards college students, and one of the goals in our, our Chinese program is that the students also have to, rep have to have a technical literacy as well as linguistic and cultural literacies. Uh, so what, how I, I scaffolded the project, uh, starting from where the students were, uh, from themselves, what they knew about themselves, for instance, in their carbon footprint, and from there, um, I was able to build out the vocabulary that they needed to know to talk about, uh, what the issues are with climate change, also um, the cause and effect, uh, which are uh, is a sequence that's commonly used in Chinese. So they had to learn how to talk about the process of why climate change came about. Um, and from there, uh, I used several different uh, sources and resources. Um, uh, for instance, Goose Chase uh, is the way I set it up as a mission for the students to go out and discover where they had to take pictures of the, what they usually use for recycling, what kind of car they drive, do they usually walk to school. Um, and then I use another program called Perusal, um, which is also for free, and these are all for free, um, online to, uh, with uh, cultural or authentic texts where students were able to um, not only uh, read and comment on the text itself, uh, but they were also uh, able to um, uh, see the comments of their classmates and from there they were able to engage both in asking questions of the text but also getting answers from their from their classmates and from that it was a very sort of seamless transition 
into the classroom. Um, I did it with, with that, with certain texts. I also worked with, uh, for instance, um, a visual literacy, which also ties into the cultural aspect of it. So seeing where the language, what kind of language is being used, for instance, in public servants and uh, service announcements versus uh, newspapers uh, versus uh, just in talking with their Chinese classmates um, on campus. Oops, there we go. Thank you so much. Um, there was a lot of rich resources there. I'm going to draw everyone's attention to a couple of them, which are, um, they have a lot of uses. So it would be something to really think about strategically how you would want to use these tools. Um, Goose Chase. Um, I'll have Megan talk a tiny bit more about that in just a second because I've heard of it but have not used it yet. And then Perusal and a similar tool called Edgy, E-D-J-I, are really awesome collaborative annotation tools um, that can be used with texts that you, um, in my case with Edgy, you paste it into the document and you can also use it with authentic images and, and the students can actually pick a spot on the image to annotate. Um, another nice feature of some of these tools, such as Edgy, I don't believe Perusal has this particular feature, but it has great features too, is that one of the ways students can comment is actually by recording what they want to say about it, so that, and that way the students can actually be kind of talking about the text orally, or they can be typing about it. Um, these tools can be really helpful in capturing student thinking, and that will come into play later when we look at the last of the HLTP and providing feedback to learners. Um, so thinking about how many ways can we visualize and capture what the students are noticing, what they're thinking. So the brainstorming that Laura mentioned, um, annotation tools like Perusal that Megan mentioned, um, really help us get a sense of not just how students write and speak, but what they're noticing when they're looking at texts, which is what they're doing in this form when they're looking for the form and the structures, and we want to capture what they're noticing. Um, Megan, can you really, really quickly, maybe like one sentence, share what Goose Chase is? Because it's pretty cool. Ah, uh, uh, Goose Chase is, um, I call it, I use it as a seek and find. Um, it's a, a tool that you can set up basically challenges or questions that you want to ask the students to do, either to type in a text or to take a photo of, of something uh, or a scan of a text. Um, I, I, I use it as a way of uh, generating student participation. It's student derived or student choice in terms of what is the the thing that they will be they will be uh, they will be taking a photograph of or that they will be responding to. I'm not sure if I'm giving a, a, a clear enough definition of it. If you want to add to, <laughs> you know, for now that's actually fine. It's just to give a sense to our participants to our attendees in case they want to go look it up because I believe it's goosechase.com if I'm not mistaken, um, but it might be you know dot net or something. So if they wanted to look it up that way, they just have a sense of what kind of tool that it is. And Megan, I'm actually going to continue with you with our second question. Um, so one of the phases of the PACE model is the co-construction phase that takes place with the teacher and the students together talking about what they're noticing. And we obviously want this to happen in the target language, um, but talking about what they're noticing once they've done the attention phase. So I'm wondering what are some ways that the co-construction phase of PACE can be structured so that it allows students to practice working in teams to complete the complex tasks of high quality project-based language learning. Yeah, that's an interesting thing about, about teams because that's certainly the one thing that we bring it towards, uh, towards as we move forward in the project with the team. What I did again was I scaffold or sequenced the, the lesson before they were actually put into their own project teams. So they would work on, uh, one is recognizing uh, vocabulary, recognizing the tools that they needed to use. They would come in together and share that. I would have them, for instance, after they calculated their carbon footprint, they would uh, engage a Chinese classmate to, uh, to, to measure their carbon footprint. And then the students had to record themselves having a conversation and comparing, uh, so noticing the comparisons 
Um, and then those uh, recordings were brought into the classroom so that other classmates could hear those recordings and comment on them, both in terms of learning about the form in which one asks interviews or engages in, in, in cross-cultural, uh, cross-lingual dialogue, uh, but also as, as far as gathering information and understanding deeper about the cultural differences um, that, that would set them up towards learning what would they would have to work on, where, where their strengths were and what they knew about the, about the Chinese culture already and what they would need to work towards. So that was one area where it was scaffolded, but uh, all the whole sequence of all the activities I did were scaffolded so that by the time it came to the, the project itself, uh, they had the language uh, to be able to to speak uh, only in the target language the whole time the whole class was always in the target language but they were not they did not break uh, the um, break out into English even while they were dealing with complex questions and complex issues as far as how to develop their project so you hit on a couple of really important things there the first one was that you built some collaborative and team type work into that co-construction phase before they even started on the content work and the high quality project-based language learning experience. So using that co-construction phase for them to build their language skills, start to get an understanding of whatever new structures they were going to need, like that sense of the kind of language you'll need if you're going to be preparing a PSA for climate change versus when you're going to be interacting with your pen pal in China. Um, and also that by doing so, you've already built in for them the supports that they'll need and the knowledge that they'll need and that they'll own so that when they do move into the big work from the project-based language learning experiences, they are in fact able to do that entirely in the target language. So I really liked how you talked about um, using the co-construction phase for them to do their comparisons and their recordings and so on, um, or comparing what they hear in the recordings and so on. Laura, did you have an idea you'd like to share about that co-construction phase to help learners get ready for what they'll have to do in the target language when they're doing high quality project-based language learning? I would like to make a confession because I primarily deal with novices and I do not think I could recommend having them do the co-construction in the target language. That because, makes sense. Because, because I want them to to feel comfortable because the I feel like the explicit breakdown of the wording in the co-construction has to be theirs. It has to belong to them. And I feel like at level one and two, which is almost exclusively, I've taught a couple threes here and there, but I'm almost exclusively teach one and two. And for them to be comfortable with it and actually be able to assimilate what they're trying to make sense of, it's, it's for their comfort that we do the co-construction, I would say in the long run too. I don't think I don't think I can recommend doing that in the target language. However, I do have some students when I, when we brainstorm the the requirements, I have them put it in their own words so that they do in fact own it, and that it's something that they can relate to and bring to mind when they need it. But I do have them in their little liter literature circle or project groups uh, pass them around and like kind of check off and make sure that they have the elements that we decided were necessary in there and then maybe add on to them for each other if they don't have everything that we mentioned. But you highlighted a couple of, uh, a really important point, excuse me. Um, the, there is this sense of really being strategic about how and when we use English. And so you're being strategic about your use of English. You're having them use it specifically to express what they're noticing and what they're learning and what this new structure means and how it's used and in doing so as you alluded like they don't have the vocabulary right now to express those things in the target language but because you took that time to make sure that they really can own this whatever this new structure is for the purposes of this particular context and this topic they are supported to use the target language when they will need to do so in order to go through the different phases of their high quality project based language learning experience and ultimately create that public product. So that careful and thoughtful work that you're doing during the co construction phase with them is building towards their ability to do that and making sure that they have the tools that they need. I would say it's an essential part of the inquiry phase in a second language in a PBLL class. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. This is how they're, and they're going to be demonstrating whether they're novice learners or the intermediate learners that Megan was talking about, their, their, their work at comparing and actively noticing patterns and so on is developing critical thinking skills, which is, as you said, a, a key part of the inquiry phase as well. So this actually kind of leads right into the next question, Laura. So you, the way you use PACE with your learners to help them learn whatever new structure or structures they're going to need for their ultimate project-based language learning experience and that public product and any interactions they're going to have with other speakers along the way, how does that facilitate um, their ability? Like, how, Can you share an example of how your work with students to use PACE to support their language development made it possible for them to do that public product, as you said, as novice users. Our, our year one and year two students are novice, and yet they're doing these great public products that are in the target language. So how, how has PACE helped your students do that? So the closest we came to achieving that was when uh, students looked at various inventions for our product pitch project. And so they, they looked at different inventions and like how they worked and they had to do uh, different they had to create guides for how to operate their inventions and so they they saw the way other inventions were presented and like descriptions of what they can do advertisements for them and so when they were pitching their products they were able to emulate some of the language like that it was really fun seeing when we we it was more of a vocabulary kind of thing than it was a grammatical structure kind of thing but where we picked out um, things like buy now and stuff like that and that kind of how it worked their way into their commercials and into their their speeches to their the sharks in their in their little shark tank and it, it did not necessarily make its way into their um active vocabulary and their spontaneous speech but it was something that they were able to fall back on for the presentational prepared speech next thing yeah, it does make sense. Um, we see that a lot with learners where if we provide them a lot of input that comes in a lot of different ways, and in this case, looking at some um, how-to guides on operating a product, they're going to repeatedly run across a couple of churns of phrase. Um, in I think in your case and in my case, we've probably also both seen times where they they start to see what is in fact a grammatical structure modeled all the time and they don't have to understand what that structure is right now necessarily but they're going to model it or emulate it as you said and that's a really important thing to remind our viewers which is that the novice learner what they do really well is emulate and imitate um, and then work at the memorized word and chunk and phrase level um, so that totally goes along with what we know about language acquisition and what our students can be consistently relied upon to do well when they are given an opportunity to do presentational communication and they are novice. Um, so I really like seeing how they incorporate those, those expressions or turns of phrase into their work. Megan, did you have something you'd like to add on that same question about using PACE um, to really help learners exhibit their work and describe their learning? um or to create their public product uh, yeah yeah absolutely again uh a lot of it just takes lots of lots of practice and so i just provide lots of vari a variety of different texts and the different opportunities from a variety of angles for the students to be able to pro uh, uh, understand and use the the vocabulary the grammatical expressions um, also the ones that they can't do even what they were going to be reading uh, to learn to begin to learn the process of skimming for the gist uh, Which is something that you there become better at in the higher levels um, So I did a variety of different kinds of, 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 of um, Things that I thought were fun We would do a mad lib at some point to sort of work with the grammatical structures and sort of play make what we were what we were coming up with, with to help the students uh, uh, take on the voice of, of, um, 
of a more, uh, I guess, more prof uh, professional or more academic, uh, and that's what academic, but a more sort of native speaker uh, language. And, and what this is, is at every point along the stage, the students were feeling a sense of accomplishment. There, I had lots of feedback that I was giving them. Um, and also uh, uh, helping build their confidence because that was uh, the more they could understand, they could see that they were able to take the material in the small chunks that I gave it to them and then be able to slowly begin to process and use it themselves, uh, their confidence grew. And so in speaking with them and telling them that this is their toolbox um, and that everybody has a different toolbox of different words or different ideas or different ways they want to express themselves, but that that was okay and that we were sharing this in a collaborative space. Uh, I think really got the students uh, excited and prepared them for the, the final sort of um, implementation of the project. Thank you. I think I want to leave the, the viewers with a couple of things there. That sense of how formative assessment and feedback um, doesn't just provide the teacher with information, but it provides the learners with confidence, encouragement, and motivation. Um, and then also the importance of helping students be okay with skimming for the gist because our learners don't know every word in their native language, but it seems to really bother them that they don't know every word in the target language. Um, and we want to help learners both become more comfortable with grasping a main idea and maybe a couple of details depending on their range of proficiency and building their ability to um, guess meaning from context. Um, in a number of different ways. So I'm really, I'm really glad that you highlighted that. The Mad Libs example is a great way to do that. I know there are some great technology tools out there that help us kind of create Mad Libs automatically. And I know one t when I was practicing a couple of structures that they come up in conversation or in language use, but they're kind of, they don't come up all the time. So you have to kind of hunt for a place to use pace, for example, with enough models. Um, and for certain language structures, creating memes can also be a great way to both provide models when you find memes from speakers of the target language that model that structure and then the you, the learners can mirror that when they create their own memes. Um, and then the last question actually Megan is going to go to you. Um, how can the phases of pace foster students development of project management and reflection skills. Uh, that's a good question. I, um, I think uh, part of that, what they were learning was, um, first of all, taking turns in terms of how people, they were, uh, they were people were, uh, the, the students were representing or presenting the material to each other um, that helped build towards them a greater sense of responsibility. And when they actually ended up being in the teams, um, they then were equipped with the material and the knowledge uh, but they all felt a sense of responsibility and all felt they had a sense of accountability to each other. Um, so that means that they were, um, they were very cognizant of the time uh, and the time limits in the classroom. Uh, luckily, these were uh, very motivated college students, so they met outside of class time uh, to, to, to work out uh, different um, questions or problems that they weren't able to address while they were in the classroom. Um, and I think also having them do this empathy mapping, um, it's where they were having to sort of anticipate what they think that these, for instance, the middle school learners, what they would think, know, see, and feel about uh, climate action and sustainability. Um, and so that also helped, uh, helped with the students um, uh, working on prototyping um, prototyping what they were eventually going to be able to do and with that prototype they were able to bring that prototype then and present it to the other half of the class that was working on another project so they got a sense of how well they were working together um, before they again before they launched in the final the final project thank you so much Laura did you have anything um, additional to add about pace fostering students development of project management and reflection I do want to underscore that it helps with the, the confidence overall and that there are a lot of kids who feel like they don't, if they don't know the reasons, if they don't know the rules, they don't really know the language. And we know that to be false, but they do not necessarily. So um, it kind of helps them to at least, it, gives, it makes them feel like they have training wheels on. Um, but it is also helpful in using it for, if you draw out structures, like you said before for the, or like Megan said, with the, for the work and for the project, um, 
like I had students working on planning uh, a shipment, a uh, fundraiser for a shipment of school supplies to Colombia. And when they were working on things for commands, they were also working on what they would command each other to do. And when they were working on questions, they were working on questions they could ask each other, like, do you have this? Do you need this? Um, do you want these? Um, who has this? So they, when they were working on their question structures, they're observing questions they were able to apply them in their conversations for their project management uh, as for their um, as for their reflection that's something that's kind of a goal for me uh, that I want to do more with we have used some kind of questions there not not again not so, as much from authentic text so more from learner kind of text but there are a lot of things they could do where they could um, even use surveys that are personality kind of quizzes where they could use those same kind of structures to ask themselves and ask each other to like do they have what they need either before the project is final the public product is presented or immediately thereafter and maybe giving advice to future future classes as well thank you i really like how in different ways both of you hit on something that's really important and when we're working with learners um especially learners who are young adult um learners and adolescents um, but also younger, you both hit on this sense of using a process and, and strategies so that it doesn't, so that it helps with confidence, but it does so in some very specific ways. You know, in this case, the learners know what to do, how to do it, what their role is in this project-based language learning experience and how to fulfill that role and what tools do they have in their toolbox to fulfill that role so that they don't get tempted to shut down, which can happen when people are nervous about make, you know, they don't want to make a mistake. They aren't sure if they know what to do or know how to do it correctly. And so by doing exactly what both of you talked about, you're actually empowering them to stay engaged and really actively participating all the way through the process.